I am not, much to my regret, a craftsman. I, I wish I were. I am not, my wife is laughing. It's, it wasn't really a joke. I, I am not a handyman. I am someone who is not, I mean, I, okay, my level of skill is that I don't have to say righty tighty lefty loosey out loud every time, okay? I can basically get some, some handyman projects done around the house, but not really. Anything more complicated, I really need some help. But I greatly admire those who do. I greatly admire people who can set their hands and their tools to raw material and turn it into something useful and beautiful. Someone like Father Bill, who's spent his whole life crafting cabinets and useful things and beautiful things. Those are, I admire that. I, I, that is not me. I mean, if you really want to go sort of by extension, sort of metaphorically, about as crafty as I get is crafting a sermon. And to an extent, some of the same kind of things go into that. You consider your subject, you consider your, your occasion, your audience, your purpose, you know, what you're going to do with that. You know, a sermon preached for a congregation on Christmas Eve is very different than a congregation or a sermon preached for a seminary congregation at an ordination. You just preach differently for those congregations because you're preaching to a different audience at a different occasion. And you have to be mindful of those sorts of things. And based on that mindset, I think that if I were a builder, especially if I were a builder of houses, I would be very mindful of whom I was building a house for. And if I were building a house, I would be asking certain kind of questions like, who is going to live in this house? And if they're going to live in this house, what kind of things are going to be doing in this house? Because a house for uh, a single person who's just graduated college is very different than somebody who's been married for 20 years and has five kids. They have very different needs. They're going to want a house that is very, very different. I think that was an amen honk in the background there. <laughs> so if you are mindful of that, it changes how you, uh, how you think about what you're going to build. And mindful of that, we can look at our, our scripture readings for today. And so from 2 Samuel, we have King David, who has finally established peace in his kingdom. He's finally put to rest all of the adversaries who are trying to put him down, who are trying to overthrow him. He's finally uh, put an end to Saul, and he has finally gotten things balanced. Speaking of balance, there we go. And now he's, he has this thought in his head, and he says, you know what? It's not right that I live in this fancy house, and God lives in a curtain, in a tent made of curtains. It's not right. And of course, what he's talking about is the tabernacle, right? Because through all of this time, after the exodus, the children of Israel built the tabernacle for God. And when they moved, they took the tabernacle down, they went with, with them, and whenever they stopped, they, res they pitched the tent, and they set back up the tabernacle, and that was where God dwelt. And when they finally made it to Jerusalem, and they said, okay, this is going to be our holy city, and they established a capital there, they left God in the tabernacle for a while. Now, the really interesting thing, and you've probably heard me talk about this a couple of times, is that Greek is a really fancy language, and it has all sorts of different words for the same thing. Like, there's four different words that all mean different kinds of love. Greek 
is a very different, or excuse me, Hebrew is a very different language. It functions very, very differently. In fact, you might even say that Hebrew is backwards because it reads backwards. Okay? So, Hebrew has this one word for a place where people live. The word is Beth. And so, if you have a homeless person and he stays in a Beth, we might read that as a hut. And if soldiers live in a Beth, that would be a barracks. And if a family lives in a Beth, then that's a home. And if a king lives in a Beth, well, that's a palace. It all depends on the context. It all depends on who lives there. But of course, if God lives in a Beth, then that's a temple. Right? Same word. Its context is different. Who lives there? It's how we translate it. So David says, I have this great house. I want to build a house for God. I have this palace. We need to build God a temple. And the prophet Nathan says, hey, seems like a great idea to me. And he goes back home, goes to bed, takes a nap. It's good godly wisdom there. Sleep on it. And the God says, nope, not for him to do. Not for him to do. In fact, he says, he wants to build me a house. I'm going to build him a house. That's powerful right there. And then, in building him this house, in this house that's going to last forever, your kingdom shall be established forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Then, we go literally a thousand years later. Historians date the reign of David to about 1000 BC. So we go a thousand years later to this virgin in the middle of nowhere in the armpit of the Roman Empire. And this angel comes to her and tells her this story that is so outlandish. She says, How could this be? And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. God, how incredible is that? He is going to, the, the Greek says, he will literally cast shade upon you. It's ironic that that phrase now, to cast shade, is something that means to insult or to to be sly about and to be suggestive about somebody's character. But that's what God does to the Virgin Mary. He overshadows her with his power and he fills her with his presence. And if we look at the Gospel according to St. John, we see some of the most incredible language in the entire, entire corpus of Scripture. From chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the Virgin Mary, we heard last week as Father Allen talked about, the Virgin Mary became the Theotokos, the God-bearer. And she bore God in her. She became the tabernacle of the Most High. Because that word where it says that the word became flesh and dwelt, it's that same language that suggests God tabernacles with us in that tent of curtains. Except he dwelt with her. And... If we look to St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, here's a hint. And just about any 316 is a good verse to look at. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 
You are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. That makes perfect sense because God himself foretold that in the Last Supper. In John chapter 14, verse 17, he said, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be with you. God is going to fill you. So we are that temple of God. Now think about that. One of the glorious things about the saints, be it St. Joseph, St. John, St. James, the Blessed Virgin Mary, they are icons of what we are called to be. So while the Blessed Virgin Mary is this model of life and behavior, she is the Theotokos, the God-bearer, because she bore Christ in her womb. But we are called to live like that because we are called to be bearers of Christ in that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. So in that, we need to be mindful and be builders ourselves. So we need to ask ourselves, what kind of temple are we building? What kind of what kind of God is going to be dwelling in our temple. Think about that. If we were building a house, we'd be asking, what kind of family is going to be living here? Do they need a big kitchen? Do they need a small kitchen? How many bedrooms do they need? Are they going to need a big living room, small living room? How many garages are they building? But we are building a temple for the Most High God who is holy and calls us to be holy. With that in mind, think about our collect for the day. Think about the opening prayer that Father Ed read. Purify our consciences, Lord, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming may find in us a mansion prepared for himself. We just don't want to be a hut. We don't want to be even a really nice studio apartment. We want to be a mansion. We want to be glorious. And that means we need to clean out the place. We need to make our temple glorious. That means there are some things that need to be cleaned out. That means we need to look at the garage and maybe go through the attic and Look at the closets and those places where you stuff things and maybe look at what we've kind of kicked under the bed for a while. We call those things sin. We need to look at those things and clean the baseboards a bit. Look at those things that we've put off for a while and said, hey, you know what, this isn't a big deal. But the truth is that the king is returning. And not just on Friday morning or Thursday night when we celebrate Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but he's coming ultimately to establish his eternal kingdom for which there are no rivals. And when he's coming, he is going to take up eternal residence and there will be no challengers. And he is going to have everything set in order. And when he comes, he wants everything in order. And our call is to look at ourselves and say, what is it that we can do to set our lives in order? What is it that we can do to say, all right, this I need to set in order. This is out of line. I want to make this right with me. Not because I'm scared that some cosmic boogeyman's going to come and do bad things to me. My God loves me. He wants the best for me. And I want the same for him. I want to be a glorious offering for him. I want my life to reflect how much I love him. 
And I want my life to be glorious for him because he has done so much for me. So as we round the stretch, we can look over here and we can see the four candles blazing and know that we have rounded these four weeks and now we have less than a week to go before we celebrate Christmas and that within a few days we are going to be celebrating this incredible feast of the Incarnation and celebrating his first advent in Bethlehem of Judea all those thousand years ago. We know that while we're celebrating that, he's going to come again. When he does, we want to be ready. Advent is a time of preparation, not about wrapping gifts and trimming the tree and all of those things which are wonderful. But even more wonderful is a king who sets all things in order, who takes away every tear, who overcomes sin and death. And as he has overcome sin and death, we can rejoice. And even in the grave, we make our song, hallelujah, hallelujah. And we can rejoice in that. And because of that, let us take these next few days and truly examine our hearts and purify our consciences that when he does come, he finds this temple a mansion prepared for himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, this is Father Scott Luckman with Church of Messiah. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and you got something out of it, please click the like button below. And also, you can click the subscribe button to get notifications in your inbox when we post other videos in the future. You can click the little bell below and you'll get uh, notifications also. So do that, and uh, we'd appreciate it. So thanks, God bless you, we appreciate it. Uh, pray for us, and we'll be praying for you. God bless you.